This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers. In times like these, we need the armor of God for the well-being of our families, to help you stand in the evil day. The Church of God International presents Armor of God, a program of biblical understanding. And now your host, Mike James. Hi, welcome to another edition of the Armor of God. We're glad you could join us on today's program. Whether you are a Christian or non-Christian, I think you can learn something from today's program. What I want to talk a little bit about is how Christians react to things, how Christians are perceived by others. Because we need to recognize as Christians that many people are looking at us, especially if we let them know we're Christians. They want to see how we're operating in the world. And I want to tell you a little story that will be a lead into our topic today. Now, not too long ago, I lost my wallet. And it was about two hours before I realized that the wallet was gone. I returned to the service station that I assumed my wallet had dropped out at, and I got to the attendant and he gave me my wallet back. He had it. I was very happy to have my wallet back and I went to my car and then I realized I had a lot of cash in my wallet that day due to party preparation for my child's birthday. Well, as I looked in the wallet, you guessed it, about $160 to $180 was gone. Now this particular individual did leave me two fives and two ones, so I'm glad for that, and they also left me my credit cards. I, I definitely was concerned by this, and I went back in to talk to the attendant. The attendant gave me a description of the person who had turned in the wallet, and I remained calm, I did not get excited, but inside I remember thinking, I want to catch this guy. Is he still around? Can we find him? Those were things that were on my mind, and I remember in talking to the individual there that others around were looking at me, thinking what had happened, what was going on. And as I thought about this later in the day, I realized, what if I was angry? What if I made some threats about this individual or something of the sort, and these people knew that I was a Christian? What kind of example would that have been? So I want you to start thinking in that regard because we're going to look today at a book I recently read. The title of this book was titled Unchristian, and it looked at the perceptions of non-Christians on Christians. And I think we can learn some things from this, whether we are Christians or non-Christians. So that's the direction we're going to take on today's program. But what I want to do before we do any of that is I want to offer you some free literature and also a free CD on today's program. Now the literature I'd like to offer you today is titled, How to Be a Real Christian. How to Be a Real Christian. Now this booklet will address many of the things we will be discussing on today's program. We also want to offer you the free CD. This is a sermon length CD, and it is titled Unchristian. This was a sermon I recently gave that will expand upon the theme of today's program. To get both of these items, the booklet, How to Be a Real Christian, and the CD, Unchristian, all you need to do is call toll free 1 888 578. 8791. That's 1-888-578-8791 or visit our website www.cgi.org. That's www.cgi.org. Go to the link for contact us and there you can request the literature and booklet from today's program. Well welcome back everybody. Again, as we were talking earlier before we went to that break, we're going to talk about a book that I read recently that was titled Unchristian. And it looked at Christians from the perspective of people who were not Christians and how these non-Christians perceived Christians. And I believe we can get some constructive free feedback from this particular book in helping us live a stronger Christian life. Before we get specifically into the book and what it was all about, I want to turn to a scripture, 
And this scripture is a very familiar scripture. A lot of people will mention it when they're talking about Christianity. And it's found in the book of 1 Corinthians. So I'm going to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm going to read a little bit about what it says love is. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek his own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So it tells us a little bit there about what love is. The Bible also says that God is love. And Christians are trying to become like God. They want to take on the characteristics of Jesus Christ. That's part of, or one of the goals of Christians in this life. Now, in order to do that, we must be of love. And here we have a little bit about love. So I want you to think about what Jesus is like. Jesus is like love. And what Christians should be like as we go into today's program and start to discuss these criticisms, this feedback that has been given to Christians by non-Christians. Now, a little bit about the book. The book is titled Unchristian. It's a recent book. It's come out within the last couple years. And the fellows who wrote this book are Christian researchers. And they do a lot of research on Christianity and non-Christians and perceptions and ideas that Christians and non-Christians have. And they are very thorough in their research methods. What they found in this book, the, the gist of the book, is it looks at the 18 to 29 age group of people who are not Christians. It called them outsiders in the book because they were outside of the Christian community. And it looked at the feedback they were giving through various questions, through personal experience, and things like that. And they honed in on six particular areas that these non-Christians felt Christians were lacking in some degree on, or they had issues with Christians because of these six particular areas. These six areas kept coming up over and over in the research, in the interviews, and in all the information they gathered from these non-Christians. So the focus of the book dealt with these six areas. Now, as time allows, I'm going to address these six areas, but the CD we're offering on today's program will get much more in-depth into each of these areas. Now, the first area that I'd like to address is hypocrisy. These particular individuals felt that many Christians that they run into or deal with were hypocrites in a sense. Now again, as you hear this today, remember, take this with a grain of salt. These are the perceptions of other people, and the experiences these other people have may be with a limited amount of Christians, but I think it's still valid to listen to what criticism people give us and try to get something from it. So they said that Christians were hypocrites, and what we mean by hypocrisy is that you say one thing and you do another. And we can cite numerous examples in the media over the last 20 years or so. Some of you can remember Jim Baker or Jimmy Swaggart. These were televangelists who were affecting millions of people who fell by the wayside due to the fact they were saying one thing yet doing another. So, of course, many of these non-Christians see examples like that, but there was even more personal information that was provided. One interesting example that was provided in the book was a research question that was posed to Christians and non-Christians alike. This research question went something like this. They asked both Christians and non-Christians, in the last 30 days, have you done any of the following? And then they went down a list. Have you viewed pornography? Have you lied? Have you gotten into a fight with someone? Have you consulted a psychic? Have you gossiped about others? Now, the Christians and the non-Christians had done these types of things. And what was most interesting about this information was only 5% more of the non-Christians had participated in some type of activity like that in the last 30 days as opposed to the Christians. 
Now again, if you are a non-Christian and you have Christian friends and they are doing the same types of things that you're doing, if they're acting in the same way that you are acting, you may start to think these folks are hypocrites because their word says one thing, their Bible says one thing, they preach from that Bible and talk about that Bible, yet they're doing the same things that I'm doing, whatever those things may be. So again, just take that, think about it, mull that over in your mind. Another area that non-Christians felt Christians had some issues with was the area of insincerity. Insincerity. Now, what did they mean by this? There was a good example that was provided in the book. There were numerous examples, of course, but this one kind of fits the bill. One non-Christian used to frequent a coffee shop on a regular basis. And he was hanging out in this coffee shop, and over time he struck up a conversation with an under, another individual. And this other individual turned out to be a Christian, and over time, the Christian, as he began to talk to this individual, invited him to a Bible study. So this non-Christian decided, hey, I'm going to go to the Bible study, check it out, see what's happening there. And I, I kind of like this guy. You know, he's been talking to me for a while. We've struck up a little friendship here. Let me, let me go check this out. So the non-Christian went to the Bible study, did not really enjoy it, and decided that he did not want to attend any further Bible studies. Well, what happened immediately after the non-Christian made the Christian aware of the fact he was not going to come back to any Bible studies, the Christian began to ignore the non-Christian at the coffee shop. He would pass right by him. He wouldn't talk to him. And the non-Christian perceived that it was due to the fact that he was not going to the Bible studies anymore. And for this reason, the non-Christian believed the Christian was being insincere. He felt as if the Christian just cared about him as long as he was interested in Christianity, as long as he was coming to Bible study, or as long as he was coming to church. And other research findings have shown this perception coming from many non-Christians, that they believe Christians are just out to save my soul. They don't really care about me as a person. They want to have a number count. And again, as Christians, we need to strike up friendships with those outside of our community, but we need to be sincere about it. If people reject our invitations to church or if people reject coming to a Bible study, we still need to be trying to reach these people. And if we are, I think they will start to see that we are sincerely concerned about them as a person rather than as a number. There were other findings within the research. Another example of this was that many of these individuals felt that Christians were anti-homosexual. Now let me say right at the beginning, the Bible is clear on homosexuality. Both the Old Testament and New Testament tell us that homosexuality is a sin. Many of these individuals who were reporting this information seem to say that Christians hone in on that particular sin rather than addressing other sins also. So as Christians, I think it's important that we realize there are other sexual sins. Lust is a sin. Adultery is a sin. Fornication is a sin along with homosexuality. So maybe when we're addressing the subject, we can bring in these other sexual sins that others in the heterosexual population get involved in too to help dissipate the feeling that others may have about our perceptions on homosexuality. But I want to emphasize again, the Bible is clear. Homosexuality is a sin. Let me give you a little story about this. There was a fellow at work years ago who was a homosexual, and he came out to people within, his, within the office that we worked in about his feelings on that subject. Now, he even told me about it, even though he knew I was pretty religious and I let people at work know about many of my beliefs and church ideas. Now, I was probably the last one that knew about his homosexuality. I was probably the last one he revealed this to. 
But by him revealing it to me, I think he felt comfortable with telling me about that because I wasn't making disparaging remarks about homosexuals or anything of the sort. And in talking to him about this, I tried to understand, well, why do you think you're homosexual? What do you think about this? When do you feel that this started for you? And to make a long story short, we were able to have conversations about religion where I explained to him what I believed and why I believed it. And I did it in a very non-emotional way, did not get excited about it, did not feel threatened that he was a homosexual. And at, at one point, we started to talk about the Da Vinci Code, which was a book that was popular at the time. He had perceptions based upon that book that I felt were incorrect. And I was able to speak to that because of the fact we had struck up this acquaintance through our work experience. So as Christians, we need to be open to communicating with everyone because God wants everyone to be saved. So I leave you that experience and let you think about that also. A couple other of the issues that were brought up by these individuals in relation to some criticisms they had about Christianity one big one that we definitely see on all the news shows on the evening cable channels is the political area. These individuals felt that Christians were too political. Now let me say right up front, I vote, and I don't think there's anything wrong with voting. I don't think there's anything wrong with taking a stand on abortion or taking a stand on various political issues that come up. But I also want to state that the only answer to the world's ills is Jesus Christ. The Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Green Party, the Socialists or Communists or whatever ism is out there or whatever new political party comes to the fore is not going to solve this world's problems. The only one who's going to solve this world's problems is Jesus Christ. But there was an interesting example provided in the book that I want to relate to you about how Christians can sometimes get too politically minded. The example was this. There was a fellow living in a neighborhood who was very anti-abortion. There was other, another fellow in the same neighborhood who was very pro-choice. One day, the fellow who was very anti-abortion, in a fit of anger, and I don't know what caused the anger, told the children, a, a young child, maybe between 9 and 12 years of age, told the child of the person who was pro-abortion that your daddy believes in baby killing. Now again, if you're telling a child that who's 9 to 12 years old, I don't think a child is ready to understand or handle what that means. Why would a Christian say that to the child of someone who had a view that was against what this Christian felt? If you have that problem, go and talk to that individual about the issue rather than the person's child. But that was a personal experience that one of these 18 to 29-year-olds had in, in their neighborhood, and they started to perceive Christians in a negative light because of that experience they had with that particular individual. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that when we put our religion out there, People are going to be focusing in on us what we say, what we do, and we need to be careful about what we say and what we do so we don't shine a negative light on Jesus Christ, who is our source of inspiration. Another area that these particular individuals brought up was that Christians were too judgmental, too judgmental. Now, the Bible says a lot about judgment, and we definitely have to judge whether an action is correct or incorrect to decide on what we should do in life. But let me show you an interesting scripture over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 12 says this, For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Speaking of those outside the church, do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves that wicked person. Now, the Corinthians were having an issue with someone in their church who was acting in a sinful manner and continuing to come to church and promoting this particular lifestyle. 
Those are the people that we need to deal with, those who have said that they are Christians and they are within that Christian community. But those on the outside who don't say they believe in God, who don't believe in the Word of God, let's let God deal with those people. Let's let God use His infinite wisdom and judgment with those people rather than us taking up a mantle against them. Another scripture I'd like to look at in regards to judgment is over in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 2, and I'm going to read you this one too. Romans 2 and verse 1. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Now get this, or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? In other words, we as Christians need to recognize the fact God has been forbearing and long-suffering with us before we came to a full knowledge of His truth. Why don't we provide a little long-suffering, a little forbearance and tolerance for those who don't understand the truth of God yet? Think back to what we said about love earlier that God is love and we need to show love towards others. I'm not saying that we need to alter our lifestyle. What I'm saying is we need to have some patience in working with those who don't understand the truth of God as we do. One final area that the book brought up in regard to some criticism these people had of Christians was they said that Christians were too sheltered. In other words, they perceived that Christians were only involved with other Christians, that they did not step outside of their own community and get involved with other individuals. Now that's interesting because as Christians, the Bible makes it clear we need to step outside of our comfort zone. We need to mix it up with the world at large because the world at large are the people that don't understand God's truth. And God wants His gospel message to go to everyone. We can do this by doing volunteer work with di different organizations within our communities. When we do that, we will come into contact with people in our communities, whether they are prisoners or the poor or orphans or whatever it may be. And once we make those connections, we can begin to connect with those people, establish relationships that will allow us to work closer. And once we start working closer, they're going to ask us questions as we ask them questions. As we listen to each other, we begin to grow and learn, and then we can open up to each other about what our passions are in this life. Now, as you look at all of these issues that were brought up in this book on Christian, I want you to remember that may not be true of you as a Christian. These were perceptions that were coming from individuals, what they perceived, what they were seeing. They didn't see all Christians acting. They didn't see all Christians doing these things. But with criticism, we need to grow from it. We need to learn from it. If you don't get criticism in life, you need to check yourself because we can only grow and learn from mistakes we make in life and what other people perceive about us. So please take this program from that standpoint, whether you are Christian or non-Christian. I hope you learned something from today's program. I want you to join us on a future episode of this program and also listen to the message that's going to come right at the end of this program. I want to thank you again for joining us. Remember, you got to put on the whole armor of God so you can stand in that evil day. Get that CD, get that booklet that we offered earlier, and listen to this short message that's going to come up right after I leave the screen. Thanks once again. Bye for now. You know, on today's program, Mike clearly illustrated to all of us that life is dynamic. 
And he further reminded many of us Christians that we need to be aware of how we publicly display our behavior. And let's face it, any of us who express some form of religiosity are held to a standard. We're in a fishbowl. Admittedly, I, I tend to agree that there is a stricter standard that seems applied to certain Christians or Christianity itself compared to other religions. I, I can't help but to be reminded of the fact that, you know, people who have in the past attempted to draw a cartoon of Muhammad are not allowed to, but boy, you could put a crucifix in a bottle of urine and call that art. It's amazing to me. Nevertheless, like it or not, Christians are indeed held to a stricter standard. Mike illustrated that if Christians are found in a hypocritical or insincere fashion, or for that matter, any kind of counterproductive behavior that would disparage the Christianity that they want people to recognize they represent, well, they're just dismissed as being a farce or a joke. Look, all of us who espouse the Christian walk need to walk that talk. The Bible is filled with appeals for all of us. In the book of Ephesians, we're told and encouraged to walk worthy of the vocation by virtue of the language there. It's illustrative of the fact that Christianity should be a lifestyle. We should walk worthy, and that word walk means to occupy yourself with or to participate in like a vocation. Also, over here in the book of Romans, and I'd like to turn your attention uh, to Romans chapter 8 and in verse 9, where we read here, Paul writing to the Romans there, a Christian in Rome, uh, he says, But you are not in the flesh, that is, in the frame of the flesh. You're not occupying your mind with fleshy things. Instead, you're in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Here's a direct appeal by the Apostle Paul for all of us Christians to be in the frame of mind if indeed we claim the Spirit of God is in us. Won't you let us help you to better understand this? Dial now 888-578-8791 and hit us on our website also at www.cgi.org. But in addition, call right now and get the free offers that we're offering. A one-hour presentation by Mike James himself titled UnChristian and an article easily read in one sitting, How to Be a Real Christian. Both of these are free for the asking. Just dial 888 8791 This is Bill Watson reminding all of you, as we often do and always do, you keep on that armor of God so that you may be able to stand in this evil day. Armor of God and the free material offered is brought to you by The Church of God International of Tyler, Texas. You may write to us at 3900 Thames Street, Tyler, Texas, 75701, or call toll-free at 1-888-578-8791, or call one 939 2929 during regular business hours. You may visit our website at www.cgi.org or email us at armorofgodcgi.org. We appreciate your prayers and support. Exploring current global conditions along with the latest social trends, the Armor of God asks the question, what are the solutions to our broken world? Right here every week, new perspectives are presented for your consideration by our commentators. The Armor of God challenges you to be vigilant in your outlook and understanding of this world in these tumultuous times. Don't miss this week's program. This program is sponsored by The Church of God International and supported by our viewers.